This week on The Book Drop, we talk about the 2020 census. The group offers up their picks for the best apocalyptic fiction. We discuss things both cute and disturbing for our query of the week. This is The Book Drop. Welcome to the book drop. I'm Erin Dewar. And I'm Ellie Roberts. And we want to talk to you about the 2020 census. Our discussion later in this episode is about apocalyptic fiction. And by the end of this segment, you'll know why those two things, the census and apocalyptic fiction are related. But to get us started, Ellie, what can you tell our listeners about the history of the U.S. census? So the U.S. Census was mandated by Article 1, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution. It requires that the U.S conducts a count of its population every 10 years, and that information is confidential per Title 13 of the U.S. Code. The census records of data of individuals are not publicly available until 72 years after a given census was taken. That specific number um, comes from a calculation that said that it's just slightly longer than the average female life expectancy. Um, But the big picture statistical data um, that the census creates is available um, to everyone as soon as it's released. So the census count is based on usual residence, which is a specific concept established way back in 1790 um, when the first census was taken. And it refers to the place a person lives and sleeps most of the time. So it counts citizens, non-citizen legal residents, non-citizen long-term visitors, and undocumented immigrants. 1850 is kind of the year that everything picked up for the census. All the exciting stuff started happening. Um, So beginning in 1850, all members of the household were named on the census, which until that date had just been the head of household. Um, This is also the year that the first slave schedules were completed, and there was a second and last one in 1860. The slave schedules included age, sex, and color, um, whatever that meant at the time, but um, most of the schedules do omit personal names, which is part of why genealogy research for um, descendants of that population is so difficult. Some exceptions were made at the time, um, especially for significantly older individuals. And then 1860 was the first year that Native folks living in the general population are identified. Um, As Native tribes are sovereign nations, their history with the census is variable, but today and in recent decades, the National Congress of American Indians highly encourages and campaigns for individuals to participate. Um, Statistically, Native folks don't get counted um, enough and as we'll talk about later, it's very important to get counted for a lot of reasons. So the 1870 census was the first to provide detailed information on the Black population, and it was also the first year that the Census Bureau embraced hiring a diverse, community-specific, and representative workforce. Um, Some of the notable historic census workers are Alexander Graham Bell and W.E.B. Du Bois, which I think is very cool. There were so many inquiries in the 1880 census that it took almost a decade to process all of them, which is absurd. Um, So in response, the U.S. then adopted the use of the tabulating machine, which was designed by a man called Herman Hollerith. Um, And then in 1950, the Census Bureau was the first non-military government department to receive and use a computer, which is very exciting. And then after the 2000 census, there was a little bit of a change to the way that the census is conducted. So the American Community Survey was introduced, which collects long form type information from a smaller segment of our population each year, whereas the 10 year census collects a smaller amount of information from our whole population. There's so many good, like, little fun facts in there. It's very exciting for us, at least. So now you know about its history. Let's talk about how to complete your census. So for the first time in its 230-year history, the census has moved largely online, but there are still three main ways to complete the census, and that's online, by phone, or by mail. If you have a permanent address, you've likely already been mailed a postcard or a letter about completing the census. And that piece of mail will contain your census ID and will provide you with instructions on how to complete the census for your household. 
if you live in group quarters, so that would mean assisted living facilities, emergency or transitional shelters, university dorms or barracks, you'll be counted by that facility. And the goal for 2020 is to count everyone, including hard to count populations, such as people who don't live in traditional housing or those experiencing homelessness. If you haven't received a 2020 census invite, you can still go to my2020census.gov and access your census ID by answering a couple questions. You can also call their toll-free phone number, which is 1-844-330-2020 to get help or complete via phone. So it's important to know that because of COVID-19, a lot of deadlines for completing the census, especially those for group quarters and special populations have been extended. So there's still plenty of time to fill out your census or get counted. So let's talk about why this is important. So why is the census important, Ellie? Well, it is how we are assigned our number of representatives in the House of Representatives. So it's very literally important to American democracy. Um, we're also the first nation that required a census in our constitution, so it's a really cool um, historical patriotic activity to participate in. And the census creates about 500,000 temporary positions for Americans, so it's also a really great employer. That's awesome. So the rallying cry for the 2020 census is if you don't get counted, you don't count, which seems very harsh, but is true. Like Ellie mentioned, it also provides or determines federal funding for things like Medicare, Medicaid, the SNAP program, which is a supplemental nutritional assistance program, educational grants, and things like Head Start, the National School Lunch Program, and Title IX funding. So at the beginning of this, I said I'd tell you how the census and apocalyptic fiction are related. And that's because when things like a global pandemic breaks out, like we're in now, or maybe when the zombie apocalypse starts, decisions about how much funding and support your community gets is based on some of that census data. So want to make sure the government knows how many vaccines you need or how many food rations your community needs, fill out your census. So if you don't get counted, you don't count. So for more information, or if you have questions or need special help, go to 2020census.gov. If you're ready to fill it out, go to my2020census.gov. And again, that toll-free number for help or to complete via phone is 1-844-330-2020. So Ellie, have you filled out your census? I have. It took so little time that I thought I did it wrong. Yeah, I did it while watching TV, and it was less than 10 minutes, definitely. So... Please fill out your census. You're important and you count. Our group discussion is up next. Hello, friends. Let's get started and introduce ourselves. Hi, I'm Michelle Carlson, the book club librarian, and you can find me at the Willa Cather branch. Uh, hello, my name is David Dick. I am a specialist at the Abrahams branch. Hi, I'm Ellie Roberts. I'm also a specialist also at the Abrahams branch. Hi, I'm Anna Wilcoxon. I am at the South Omaha branch as a diversity and inclusion librarian. And I'm Erin Dewar. I'm the Readers and Writers Librarian at the Main Library downtown. So this week's discussion is about apocalyptic and other fiction set in what at least appears to be end times. So in the last month or two, I think a lot of us have noticed that there are some people who are very into facing the apocalypse head on through reading movies and TV, while some of us just want to look the other way or find some kind of escape. So we're going to explore this idea a little bit and offer up some reading, watching, and listening suggestions along the way. So to get started, I'm interested in hearing from everyone about your relationship to apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic fiction in its many forms. So tell me, do you normally read apocalyptic fiction? Are you reading it now more or less that we're in a pandemic? And if you are reading it, what are you kind of, are you leaning towards? So Michelle, let's start with you. So I would say this isn't necessarily a go-to genre for me. Uh, however, I realized that I have read quite a few of the more in the dystopian side of things, like after some type of big disaster, but you never actually learn necessarily what that disaster was that kind of led to this new world. Um, and that's typically in the young adult category also that I've read more books in. Um, and I think there's something really fun about learning how the teenage perspective is handling these types of situations. And I think that's very real right now, especially our teenagers are really experiencing a lot of loss and grief too with um, missing out on some of these key high school memories and stuff. But otherwise it's not a, it's definitely not the type of book I'm reading right now. <laughs> I'm definitely more in my comfort zone with memoirs and biographies or just fun, silly things. Um, 
short books uh, kind of things. I'm very much into astrology, not afraid to admit it. And so reading about my sign um, and a little bit about what um, this little baby I'm about to have, uh, what their sign <laughs> is going to be too and what that means for them. Yeah. <laughs> What, uh, can I ask what, what sign will your baby be? Their sun sign will most likely be Taurus, mm -hmm. uh, as long as they're, you know, born before the, uh, like, I think it's May 18th or 20th, mm -hmm. I think is when it, that turns, so. Yeah. Solid, solid. Yeah, yeah. love a Taurus. Yeah. I have a, yeah. yeah, I have a friend who's a Taurus, so we've just been sending her, like, pictures of Highland cows, if you've ever seen them have, like, bangs. <laughs> 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 like, happy Taurus season. <laughs> They're so oh cute. They're so cute. <laughs> I love that. Yes. Okay. Uh, David, how about you? Um, I normally read a lot of apocalyptic fiction. Uh, if anyone saw my uh, cut resources for this episode, they would probably know mm -hmm. that. Um, I was le leaning against it a lot when this started because I just didn't want to engage with it. Now I'm getting back and in, back into that headspace. I don't have any plan to read right at the moment, but you know, like I wrote a blog post, uh, read our blog on omahalibrary.org. I wrote a blog post that'll be posted there sometime about plague fiction. I was thinking the whole time, yeah, I could, I could get into the, back into this soon. Awesome. Ellie. Yeah, I typically don't seek out apocalyptic fiction. Um, if something comes across my radar that sounds particularly interesting, I'll pick it up, but it's not really a genre that I do a lot of looking out for. Um, I really appreciate working with David because he's always got his like finger on the pulse of good apocalyptic fiction. So if there's something out there that's like pretty interesting, I'm probably going to hear about it from him, which is really nice. Thanks, David. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Anna, how about you? So yeah, pre-COVID, I really dug a good dystopian novel and read a lot of them like pretty regularly. And um, in the first stages of this, like we talked about a couple podcasts ago, um, I was having a hard time reading like everybody else. And just the thought of reading anything was challenging, let alone reading something that would maybe seem like too real or scary. But I read a um, pandemic book for this week's discussion, and it, I was a little worried that it would like deteriorate my mental health severely, but it actually was, uh, I think, more riveting to me because it was so much more relatable. Um, so it felt like kind of a coping mechanism. I don't like I, I read a lot of news, so I feel like I know what's going on in the world, but there's something about reading, I think a work of fiction, you can see it, the situation more holistically almost, and that made me feel a little, I don't know, better equipped in a, in a way. Yeah. So for me, kind of like Michelle. So I would say like five years ago, I was reading a lot of young adult fiction and I was super into post-apocalyptic stories because that's super rich in young adult fiction. Mm -hmm. So I would like eat any of that stuff up. But lately I'd say like in the last few years, I'm not reading as much of that. And like Ellie, I think I, if there's something that sounds super cool or interesting or has like an interesting take, I would pick it up now, but I don't seek out post-apocalyptic reading i would say especially i have been watching like disaster movies the last week or two which i mm. was finding oddly comforting so like i watched um day after tomorrow <laughs> and then i watched deep impact and i don't know they were more well especially like day after tomorrow for some reason is a weather movie but it was like more there's stuff in there that was really relevant to me right now mm. and i think when I read, you have to live in it so much and movies are so much more of a distraction for me and they almost mm -hmm. always end up with like a happy ending. Whereas I feel like a lot of the fiction I would pick up do not have a happy ending. So I'd say that's accurate. Yeah. <laughs> I've been steering clear of it a little bit. Uh, so we all came prepared to talk about some of our picks, maybe some of our favorites from apocalyptic fiction. I think in its many forms, we're going to talk about books, TV, and movies. So we're going to go around in a kind of round robin style and share. Let's start with Michelle. So as I said, um, I've read quite a bit of young adult fiction, and I think there's something that we can always learn from these books, even as adults. And one topic that is super relevant right now is that a teenage girl will save us. 
<laughs> so it's a bit of a common trope in um, the YA genre. And so in the book, Light Years by Emily Ziff Griffin, Louisa is a talented coder who lands a dream fellowship for a tech giant. Louisa's life is then thrust into chaos as a deadly virus sweeps across the globe, killing thousands and sending her father into quarantine. She receives a cryptic message about a potential solution for stopping the epidemic and embarks on a quest to save the world. I found this one really interesting in the way that the characters are portrayed, and I, it was very engrossing. David, what's your first pick? This was hard for me because I had to narrow things down uh, since I read a lot of apocalyptic fiction. So I decided to do a short story collection with a wide variety on the theme and with a lot of writers that I like. I'm doing This Way to the End Times, which is edited by Robert Silverberg. It presents all its stories in chronological order, starting like uh, back in the early 20th century and going to what was then contemporary, which was 2016. And so you get to see all the changing cultural anxieties about the uh, end of the world. There's going to be a wide variety of themes and appeals in it. Uh, some personal favorites of mine include uh, James Tiptree Jr.'s Bleak, The Screw, uh, Screwfly Solution, Brian Aldis is sweeping the heresies of the huge god, and Fritz Leiber's oddly hopeful a pa uh, pail of air. You can find it in print in the OPL catalog. That sounds cool. Ellie, how about you? Yeah, so I'm going to talk about Severance by Ling Ma. Um, it came out in 2018, and this one has been on my mind recently because one of my friends who lives in New York City like has been referencing it um, through her kind of day-to-day -day life um, right now. So. In this debut novel, you follow Candace Chen, who works in the publishing world, while she shows up to work like way long after most folks have fled New York City during the outbreak of the fictional disease Shen fever. So she sh keeps showing up to a building that's just like bereft of staff. There is no communication or guidance from her higher ups. She's just kind of following this habit of going to work. Um, the subways start closing and the taxis dwindle. And I find these scenes just like really incredible. They capture the mood and sensation of extreme isolation, but then they're contrasted with Candace's commitment to routine and habit, which honestly is like kind of hard for me to understand. So I found it super intriguing. I think that Ma's writing is more grounded and narrative based, but this beginning part of the book reminded me so much of reading my year of rest and relaxation because I found it just like fascinating and frustrating. <laughs> so eventually Candace escapes in like the last operating taxi in the city. She's truly probably the last person alive there. Um, and she finds a group traveling to a site that their leader refers to as the facility. So when she joins this group, she decides to hide the pregnancy she's experiencing from her travel companions, which ends up being a decision that you will understand as a reader. Um, so most of this book, uh, or much of the book at least, explores what maternity and new life means to a community desperate for survival. But what really stuck with me is the question, why does Candace Chen keep working at her job? So if you read this book and you figure that out, please let me know. It is haunting me to this day. I will say too, like, I don't think I actually knew what that book was until I was looking up like apocalyptic fiction and that one kept coming up. It has like this pretty pink cover. So you have no idea that that's what it is. And then I was also fascinated by it. So I hope, like want to read it at some point. Yeah, we do have it in ebook and physical book. Um, and yeah, I picked it up because I uh, adopted a policy in like 2018 that if I saw a book with a pink cover, I was more likely to check it out. I love that. <laughs> I, don't know. I support so, it. Publishing world. <laughs> it's working. Anna, what's your first pick? Yeah, so uh, my first book is a book I read a few years ago. It was called Oryx and Crake by Margaret Atwood. And it's uh, book one of a trilogy called the Mad Adam trilogy. So the premise of this book is that a brilliant but misguided bioengineer has released a pathogen into the world with the intent of eradicating humans. Um, he believes that the future is genetically modified creations, not actually people. So this book is really more about the fallout from that rather than like the actual experience of people dying from the pathogen. But it has a lot to say about capitalism, the role of government, technology, a relationship with science, and she creates a really immersive and expansive world that I really, really loved. Um, I found it kind of to be the perfect mix of 
um, like a believable near future dystopia and also extreme fantastical kind of ideas like all these genetically modified animals that do very bizarre <laughs> things that you don't expect them to do in our world. Um, so this is available through Omaha Public Library as a downloadable audiobook and also an ebook format. And the other two books in this series are also available digitally. You can download The Year of the Flood as an ebook, which is the second book. And then the final uh, book in this series is Mad Adam, and that's available as an ebook or as a downloadable audiobook. Really smart and engrossing writing. Awesome. My first pick is The Power by Naomi Alderman. So The Power takes place in what is essentially our world, but young women begin to gain the ability to shoot electricity from their fingertips, which sounds like the beginning of a superhero story, but that's not what this is. Um, as like a counter to Michelle's, I think we'll be saved by teenage girls. This is like teenage girls might be the end of us. So when I read this book, it really kind of shook me to my core. So I feel like so often we're presented with this idea that a female dominated society would be like more serene or fair or gentle. And that's not what happens in this. Um, so the book kind of asks the questions, what happens if you take the quote unquote less dominant sex and let and have them gain like immediate physical dominance. So it's incredibly gratifying to see women like fight back against like attackers and oppressors. But as we know from like history, strength is not used just to like use for self-defense or to fight for what is right. So I think a lot of people wanted to call this book feminist, and I don't think that's the author's necessary intention. It's really more getting you to try to like question gender and power dynamics because the women in this book are not all awesome. Some of them are terrible. It's not a feminist manifesto. And it introduced the idea of what is essentially toxic femininity and my like mind kind of exploded. <laughs> it made me think about toxic masculinity in a totally new way, actually. So while it's not a plague or a pandemic book, this like huge biological shift like largely plays out like an apocalypse. It's told through a rotating cast of narrators from like across the globe. And as the story progresses, they all kind of come together towards the climax of the book. I would recommend it for readers who want to read apocalyptic fiction right now, but nothing that's too close to our current situation since we don't have superpowers. Um, and for those who are looking for something like it's fast paced, it's thought provoking, but I would also say it's like a wild ride. So it's pretty distracting um, of a read in like a good way. It is available from OPL as an ebook and e audio and a physical book and preloaded audio book. Michelle, what's your second pick? Yeah. So for another book with a strong female character, I'm recommending The Line Between by Tosca Lee. Uh, this really is leaning into more of the thriller side of the genre versus maybe your science fiction type uh, theme. So our main character, Winter Roth, is kicked out of her doomsday cult and tries to readjust to, quote, normal life in Chicago. Um, but the world has gone mad with an ancient disease that has emerged from the Alaskan permafrost. So this is a frighteningly believable story and will definitely keep you up at night. So if you have any struggles with sleeping, this might be the thing to go for because it's definitely compelling and fast paced and very sus suspenseful. Michelle, that second pick sounds like stacked. Like, yes, it's got a cult. It's got permafrost. <laughs> like, yes, <laughs> yes. I mean, also, cult is based out of Iowa. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, and the author is a local. Is is local? She's um, from Nebraska. Who's currently living here? David, what's your second pick? I went with a movie for my next pick. I went with Children of Men. I know there is a book. I wasn't familiar with the book when the movie came out, and it made a huge impact on me. The feeling of hopelessness uh, that you really get in the beginning of it, where all the awful things are happening just off screen, but you are kind of figuring it out, is a lot of how uh, I felt, especially in the past uh, first couple weeks of the pandemic. I al it's also the movie that I feel like I'm in the most when I go grocery shopping. Uh, <laughs> there's a, some masterful use of uh, long takes and uh, the way it stays with the lead character's point of view you really can see someone who's becoming more aware of just how bad things are. Uh, you can find the DVD at OPL, and you can also uh, find the movie on streaming on Hulu. Cool. I have read the book. I, I do think the movie is, I liked it better. I guess I would say that, so. And that, yeah, the, that movie, the movie makes me it's, cry. Yeah, it's beautiful, so yeah. Ellie, what's your second pick? 
so my next pick is not beautiful uh, <laughs> it's exciting but not beautiful i was gonna ask earlier is that are there any like locations that you guys if you pick up a book and read its jacket you're like it's set in this city i am more likely to read it do you guys have any spots like that lately i'm super into la fiction just i love something i like movies set in la too because it's such a unique terrain and stuff but i also feel the same way i just like an la vibe <laughs> i really like things that are set in the midwest because i'm always fascinated by people's take on it and as i think our our region is very expansive also and so a story about uh kansas or set in kansas is going to be very different from one in like south dakota or nebraska itself mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like if I've lived someplace or spent a lot of time there due to travel or any kind of situation like that, I might be a little more, that might be like a, a tipping point factor to get me to be like, if I'm waffling, like, to be curious about someone else's take on a place I know well. David, you got anywhere? I like, I like books that involve people traveling to different dimensions, so that, <laughs> that will draw me to, as the, as the uh, resident biggest uh, genre nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so part of what I liked about Severance was that it's set in New York City, and this next one, um, New York City is kind of my, like, evergreen location that I'm like, ooh, yes, I do want to read about that. Um, but this next one is set in Seoul, which is, like, my very, like, on-trend location that I love to read about. So it's a movie called Train to Busan. Um, we do have it in our collection, um, but it's also available to stream on Netflix right now um, since we can't access those. So it's a South Korean action horror film and you follow a father whose name is Sook Woo and his young daughter Suan on their trip from Seoul to Busan so that she can spend her birthday with her mother. The father and daughter are kind of um, they have a tense relationship. She's really young and he's having a hard time being like an active presence in her life. Um, so you see that a lot of that. So right before the train departs, a figure just stumbles onto the train pretty unnoticed by the staff, um, which is a random moment that sets off a chain of just like terrifying, brutal attacks. Um, so I watched this movie the second or third week that the libraries were closed and it really worked for me. Um, it's apocalyptic, it's a take on a zombie movie, um, but it's pretty dissimilar to what we're experiencing, which really let me burn off some anxious energy. I really love the pacing of it and um, the super tight setting of most of the movie because it takes place on a train um, requires a lot of creativity from writing and filming standpoints. Um, so I loved watching the different like narrative and visual twists that the team came up with in such a like packed setting. Um, so that is Train to Busan. I highly recommend it. Um, it is in, in Korean, so you'll have to watch it with subtitles unless you're fluent in Korean, which congratulations. <laughs> I'm going to add that to my queue. That sounds great. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sounds right up my alley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, and it's like high action. It's, it, there's a lot going on. I thought it was super fun. Nice. Uh, my second book is, it came out pretty recently. It's called The Dreamers by Karen Thompson Walker. And it was a book that felt very real for this moment. It's set in a small, sleepy college campus in California, and a new virus has suddenly has shown up. Um, the only thing that people understand about it is that it's airborne, <laughs> highly contagious, and it causes people to fall asleep. Um, hence the title. There's some a facet of the story that has to do with dreams. So some people begin to die. Some people just die in their sleep. Some happen to fall asleep while they're driving a car, or maybe they left the oven on in their house, so they die from the resulting accidents of that. Some people end up staying asleep, and some begin to wake up, but are they the same afterwards? Maybe, maybe not. I don't want to give anything away. So um, it was both kind of fascinating and terrifying to read this right now. Um, just, you know, reading about people's reactions to quarantine mandates and the damage that can be done by people that don't take these kinds of threats seriously, shortages of gas, food, gloves, masks, all that kind of stuff. So many things that like I would not have that wouldn't have you know felt like real life a month ago so i don't think i would have been as invested in this book if i had tried to read it like two months ago as opposed to now i may not have even picked it up so yeah it was just very relatable and i also i liked that it was told through the lens of multiple people who are impacted by the virus in different ways and involved with it in different ways so you got um 
yeah, a nice, like nice layers of perspective and experience there. So yeah, I recommend it. It was uh, available through OPL as an ebook or also as a downloadable audiobook. Her debut novel would also fit into this, The Age of Miracles. No, so oh, I've seen a, that. But yeah, so that. it's like set in days start getting longer. And so the like more sun starts throwing off people's biological clocks and it's this like slow deterioration of society. And I think it's mostly affecting teens. And so mm-hmm. I thought about it for this, but it actually doesn't make me feel great. So I did not. <laughs> So my second pick is The Leftovers, and I really like talking about The Leftovers because we have two very different versions to choose from or enjoy. So millions of people disappear in what is like a rapture-like event in the remaining citizens of a small town, including one family, the Garvey family, that's completely intact. I love to figure out how to continue on. So it's filled with a chain-smoking doomsday cold, a self-proclaimed miracle healer, and plenty of like suburban malaise. The book is witty and irreverent but you might also be familiar with the HBO television series that kind of use that same story through a dark and cerebral lens. So Tom Perotta, the author, is no stranger to having his work adapted. So he wrote Election, which was turned into a movie that was filmed here in Omaha by Alexander Payne. He also wrote Little Children and Mrs. Fletcher, both that haven't been adapted. What I find interesting about his work is that when I read his books, they're like very sharp and funny, kind of in an awful way. And most of the time when it's adapted, they're like a lot darker stories. And my guess is because it's easier to make a darker story than joke about dark things, right? Mm -hmm. So as a book lover, like I originally stopped watching the television series because it was so different from the book. And so I had to stop, but then I eventually went back and it's like in a phenomenal TV series with characters I love. I would say the book is really subtle and I like it that way, but the TV show is pegged as like a supernatural mystery drama, which is not what the book is. Um, and I think it's really interesting that the book doesn't care wh- why this huge thing happened, why did people disappear, but the TV show and its characters are like obsessed with that idea. And I think it's what drives the series. So I think it's a perfect example of how you can like enjoy the adaptation separate from the source material, but like them both for completely different reasons. So you can find the leftovers of the book in our catalog as a downloadable audiobook and a print book. TV series is on DVD in our catalog. It's also streaming on HBO if you have that, and I think Direct TV. So I think it'd be a nice little binge right now if you wanted to watch like three seasons of TV. <laughs> Let's do a bonus real quick. Does anybody have an extra one they want to talk about? Oh well, I so this is another book I read quite some time ago. It's called Black Wave. It's written by Michelle T. And I wanted to include it here because I think it's the most like playful apocalyptic novel that I've read. Like if you want to read a story that's both about the world's ending and that might make you laugh, like this would be a good one. And also I like this one because it's set in the 1990s and I feel like it's uncommon to see a dystopian novel that's like kind of looks back and is set in the past. So our destruction of the environment, not a, pe- not a pandemic, is what's ushering in the end of the world. And this story is set in San Francisco and Los Angeles, and it's semi-autobiographical, like most of her work tends to be. The protagonist is a substance-loving and abusing writer. She's kind of careening through her normal life, um, living on the fringes and exploring her sexuality. And then the news comes out that the world only has one year left of existence. So this book is about the changes that she makes in her life as a result. Um, her relationships with people, with poverty and substances all change. And then also talks a lot about her relationship with writing, which was really interesting. Um, so it's kind of a fun apocalyptic novel. Um, we have this in print format at the library. Yeah, in terms of like fun apocalyptic novels, I'm not gonna get too far into this one, but mm-hmm. Hollow Kingdom um, by Kira Jane Buxton mm-hmm. um, came out last year, and it's so funny. It's told from the point of view of a, a pet crow. Um, yeah, exactly. That is um, like living through the zombie apocalypse, and it's just like delightfully silly and kind of crass and just, yeah. I mean, imagine like a sassy like crow narrating the <laughs> apocalypse. It's yeah. delightful. It's been on my list. I'll have to read it. I also have a fun one, and I saved it for last because I feel like it's pretty popular, but I like to talk about it. Uh, And that's Why the Last Man by Brian K. Vaughn, which was a comic series from 2002 to 2008. Um, And it follows York Brown, who's like a seemingly normal guy. And then all of a sudden across the world, all animals with a Y chromosome 
die horribly, like in an instant, except for York and his capuchin monkey ampersand. So <laughs> it's essentially a road trip story with him. He teams up with Agent 355, who's sent by, by his mom to protect him, but also to try and basically save humanity. So it's so fun. I mean, it's also heartfelt. Like I'm probably, I'm sure I've cried and I've read it multiple times through. It's pretty to look at. Brian K. Vaughn's like one of my favorite graphic novel writers. So I would also say if you want to laugh while looking at the end of humanity, like there you go. <laughs> That's a very good one. Yeah. I, I love why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> David, you got a bonus? Oh yeah. Um, I saved this as a bonus because I talked about it in our first episode, but it was my favorite book of 2019, so I could not not talk about it. This is A Song for a New Day by uh, Sarah Pinksker. Uh, it's about a series of bombings and a plague uh, that causes all public, uh, large public gatherings to be banned, and it develops into a character-driven uh, sci-fi dystopia about the healing catharsis of rock and roll. Uh, Pinksker is a musician, and I'm a mu musician too, so it was a Nice end for me. I love it both, both as a science fiction fan and as a musician. Awesome. Very cool. And actually, I do have one. Uh, when I think about like things that kind of bring you comfort, but are like, why is this weird thing bringing you comfort? Um, I've been rewatching Battlestar Galactica on the Sci Fi Channel. Um, and it is a militaristic post apocalyptic or uh, post war kind of fiction narrative about how uh, this colony had to is trying to survive. And I really like the story of the leadership and how that ties into the survival of the colonies and the kind of good versus evil uh, tied in each character, you know, with themselves, with the, the enemy of the Cylons and, and all that kind of stuff. It's just really great story. Awesome. Last week for Query of the Week, I set a terrible precedent and went way over time. <laughs> so I'm going to try and be brief. Um, but every week for Query of the Week, we ask the group a question. We all have to answer it. Um, we also pose it to our audience if they want to chime in. And the Query of the Week this week is, who is your favorite monster? So my favorite monster is Stay Puffed the Marshmallow Man from the first Ghostbusters movie. Two reasons. One, for years of rewatching, I always forgot that he's in the first movie. I always thought he was like in a different movie. So he shows up in the third act and it's always like this really pleasant surprise. But mm -hmm. mostly I love him because he's cute and terrifying and that's very <sighs> on brand for me. So that's mine. <laughs> mine is The Thing from John Carpenter's The Thing. Uh, one of my favorite movies of all time. It really captures the feeling of isolation and paranoia that a lot of people probably have felt throughout uh, this pandemic. Kurt Russell has a great line in the movie, nobody trusts anybody now and we're all very tired. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> if you haven't seen the movie, it's about a uh, shape-shifting alien life form that takes the place of people when it kills them. It, yeah, it's a great movie. It's very entertaining. Yeah. So I picked uh, The Haunted House, uh, which is kind of a weird take on a monster, but I listened to Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House on audiobook a few months ago, and the narrator did an incredible job of like adjusting her voice to show the house's effect on Jackson's characters. It's so spooky. Um, I highly recommend doing that one on audio. And just overall, I'm a sucker for the haunted house trope that like the monster is already inside of us and just needs the right environment to like like wreak havoc and destruction on our lives. So that's my monster. That's an awesome pick. Um, um, I actually had a hard time with this question because I don't, I don't, I don't gravitate towards like things with monster, like horror kind of stuff or yeah. But uh, my pick is a character from uh, Jim Jarmusch's film, Only Lovers Left Alive, um, Eve, played by Tilda Swinton. She's just a really cool bohemian vampire. <laughs> <laughs> She's got great style. Um, she and her partner have been together for like centuries and they've been trying to um, get their blood in like very safe, sanitary, ethical <laughs> conditions and that starts to change. So they have to change how they are able to continue to survive. But it's, yeah, she's a vampire, but not like, I don't truly that scary she's a Maybe. conscious vampire like a socially <laughs> and sustainable like conscious vampire. trying to be the best vampire she yeah. can yeah <laughs> just a modern vampire that sounds great ethical consumption yes <laughs> yeah. michelle do you got one i have a love-hate relationship with gremlins <laughs> um as far as like you know 
when they're, you know, if you don't feed them and you don't get them wet and everything, they're just super adorable and you love them. But oh my God, <laughs> once they multiply, they are terrifying. And I definitely had some nightmares about them as a child. Same. Um, and it's <laughs> very hard to go back and actually watch it and enjoy it, the, the, the movie. Um, and also another thing that terrified me as a child was uh, the nothing from the never ending story. Just the idea of this all-consuming thing that uh, makes you disappear, makes everything disappear. It's it's very saddening and terrifying. That's terrifying. Yeah. Gremlins are my runner-up because I also think yeah. they're terrifying and cute. And right. <laughs> if you haven't watched the second movie recently, rewatch it because it is bananas. <laughs> it's like set yeah. in a mall office building right. and it's nuts. <laughs> yeah. Gremlins 2 and Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, the two reasons why we have PG-13 now, like both those were rated PG oh. in the 80s. Oh. Right, I think you're right, yeah. Okay. Trendsetters. <laughs> well, that is our episode. Thank you for joining us on The Book Drop. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much for joining us. We'd love to hear your answer for our next query of the week, which is what book have you read more than once? If you want to chime in with your answer, you can send your responses in a tweet length response to our email, which is thebookdrop at omahalibrary.org. The Book Drop is produced by Omaha Public Library. Our theme music is dropped in amber, courtesy of the band Lucid Fugue. Don't forget to subscribe to The Book Drop on your favorite podcast app and like and follow Omaha Public Library on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We'll talk to you next time on The Book Travel.